Good morning once again, everyone, and welcome back to another session for today's Digital Marketing Conference. Again, you're on track, Powerful Brands. Now about me, again, I'm Maria, and I will be your host for today. I'm going to help you connect it with the, with the, with the speaker. We're going to try to get your questions to, to the speaker. And obviously, please, please, we encourage your active participation today as our knowledge partners, Pat and Manning, will be awarding the most active attendees who rate sessions and leave comments with free e-books. Now for the speaker, we have here Bran Kerner. He founded Kerner Design in 2018 to help his clients develop innovative new products, experiences, and environments. Corner Design specializes at the intersection of architectural placemaking and digital media systems. Now, Brad is an entrepreneurial project leader with a range of design, marketing, and product management experience. He has spent 20 plus years in the architectural lighting and construction industries, panning global matrix organizations, design consultancies, and startups. Brad is also an accomplished speaker and writer exploring the future of immersive digital and lighting experiences. Now, what are what are we um, expecting for this presentation? Now, and there is the revolution underway and how location-based experiences are conceived, designed, and executed. The digital and physical worlds are fusing together with physical architectural spaces being ever more considered to be portals to the virtual world. Now, tying our physical spaces to the virtual world requires a host of radically different design theories, design methodologies, technical skills, and project execution. And Brad's going to show us how that will be possible today. So without any further ado, Brad, the stage is yours. Wow, Maria, thank you. That was such a great, great introduction. You read that so well. It's easy to type those words and very hard to say those words, huh? Um, yes, everybody, I'm Brad Kerner, uh, and this is every surface of screen, now what? Um, let's look at, um, take a moment and look at where we are in the world, right? We're in the year 2023, right? And I think a lot of people still think of the future as this thing that's off into the future somehow, right? We look at classic sci-fi like Blade Runner, <clears throat> and we don't realize that we live in that world already, right? This is the tire stadium. Uh, the roof is covered with a large format LED screen just for uh, airplanes and drones. Uh, Minority Report, already 20 years old, the famous scene of him walking through the shopping mall where the reactive large-scale signage, right, that is now available in your local convenience store where you have uh, retail displays that react to your presence and understand what you do. We have Star Trek, the famous holodeck that could transport you anywhere. This is now how Hollywood is making the bulk of its production with these large volumes that can take you to anywhere, any time. And we see this throughout um, various industries, the adoption of digital signage, digital projection, and digital lighting. Traditional theme parks has obviously been one of the leaders in this area, but we also see this now moving extensively into museums, the sort of Instagram museum experience, but traditional museums too are embracing this. We're seeing food and beverage facilities embracing this, even at the scale of um, indoor mini golf games are now using interactive projection mapping. We see these technologies revolutionizing sports. We see esports becoming an entire thing where uh, groups are building purpose built arenas around esports, and we're making sporting interactive in new ways. But <clears throat> what exactly is an immersive digital experience, right? It's really easy to understand what a digital experience is when you're looking at your little black mirrors, but it's a lot harder, I think, for most marketing professionals to understand what does that mean in the physical world? Well, obviously, we start with the guest experience, and we have to have some digital displays or digital lighting or whatever. It's all the same thing, really. And then we have to add some media content, right? And if you've ever worked on real projects, you might realize a lot of projects only get as far as the digital displays and don't even properly budget for the media content, but that's the sort of baseline. And then you might get smart about how you're serving up that media content using various data streams and live feeds. And then you might wanna understand the physical reactions to that or monitor the views or attribution. So you add sensors into the space 
And then you might say, hey, just beyond making passive impressions, we want to drive action and we want to see physical action or interactivity with the media. And then finally, you have the sort of touch interaction, high level interactions with the experience. That is great, but that's all the technology behind it. What is an immersive experience for the guest? I contend that there's really two primary things that we try to do for an immersive guest experience. Number one is making memories. You can call it brand impressions or whatever you want, but we want to create a distinct moment in your mind of seeing something unique that was driven in a place. We also could drive action, right? We could actually ask people to walk a certain way, or we could ask, <clears throat> excuse me, ask them to interact with our screen or brand in a certain way. And then what's usually missing from those concepts is we can make this whole system smarter, right? Using machine learning, using AI nowadays, we can derive uh, knowledge from all of those sensor systems and interactions, and we can create a complete loop. <clears throat> Excuse me, pardon me. So let's go back now and look at the fundamentals of digital signage and where we really stand, right? If every surface can, becomes a screen, now what? So we're going to look at the implications from a design and a sort of creative retail brand presentation point of view. First, I think it's really important for everyone to understand that we can now have digital signage in every crazy format your imagination allows. We start with these direct view LED screens. Now, this is different, right? You know, we have LCD screens and there's a lot of confusion that you have LCD screens with LED backlighting. But what I'm talking about here is really direct view LED screens. And once you can make those into various shapes, you can make them into all different wild geometries. You can curve them now, they become flexible. So between curved and shapes, you can do things like compound curves. So for example, the tops of these fluted columns, which if you understand construction, you understand that that's a difficult shape to make in any media, whether it's plaster or digital, it's very challenging. So now we live in this world where we can deploy digital signage in any creative format, shape, or size that we, we can dream of. There's really no limitation to that. And even just five years ago, you were largely constrained to flat surfaces. Now we can do things like a Mobius loop, if you can believe that, as direct view uh, LED signage. And if even if you think about just 20 years ago, the state of the art was a Sony Trinitron, right? Now we can do boxes of video. We can do circles of video. We can do perfect spheres of video. We can do... Um, multifaceted, whatever you want. That's an actual, not projection mapped piece, but that's an LED display. So we have to break this mold of digital signage and digital retail is sort of the standard 16 by nine LCD. Um, because what happens is, is we have burnout, right? We really experience that when you walk through a modern, let's say airport or a shopping mall and you're drowning in all of this sort of standard digital signage on 16 by nine screens, no one pays attention to it because they're all looking at their phones, their other 16 by nine screens that's in their hands. So this really doesn't work, right? You can put gorgeous content on there and people just walk right by it and there's very little, if any, engagement. You can start to break the proportions. You can start to break the scale. So you can have one-to-one -one images of, for example, fashion models on the screen. You can layer visual acuity. So that center screen might be a high resolution LCD screen, and the surrounding might be a sort of lower resolution digital lighting. And then once you do that, you can break the dimension and go into three dimensions and start to surround people with a more immersive experience that's all tied together. But as I said, we can make LED direct view screens in any shape you want. So you don't even have to think in planar terms. You can go crazy. And this was actually an image I made in 1999 uh, for my graduate thesis in architecture, where I was speculating on what the future of these trends would be. And I said, if Frank Gehry or Zaha Hadid had digital uh, surfaces as a architectural material, what would they do with them? Nowadays, I can just enter a few words in the mid journey and create compositions like this. You have to really think to yourself, what part of this is a digital screen? Uh, what is that content? What is physical, right? The screens can take any curving shapes they want. Um, the content can be vivid, can be bright. It's really, again, only limited by your imagination. Same example here is this 
real? Is that a textured surface or is that simply an LED wall that has gorgeous three-dimensional content on it? Uh, last year, there was a lot of buzz about the metaverse, which came and went again, which was very predictable, right? Because if you've been around the block, you know that VR has been out there since the 90s. I mean, I remember uh, Walt Disney World had actual VR attractions in the mid 90s going. I mean, this technology has obvious limitations. It's big, it's bulky, it's awkward to use, it's antisocial. Um, it has very limited applications that make sense for. But what most people don't think about is creating a sort of virtual reality experience in physical real life, right? Um, <clears throat> with these large format LED screens, they can become an entire architectural wall. Once it becomes a wall, and once you hit about 0.5 millimeter pixel pitch, if you're standing roughly arm's length away from that wall, your eyes can physically not perceive the pixels which means that if you're standing in front of an experience, like for example, a huge wall that could be digital in the background, um, you will no longer be able to perceive if that's digital or not. Your eyes physically cannot take uh, perception of individual pixels. These screens have already reached daylight brightness. Um, they uh, are effectively simulating reality and you won't know the difference. Another trend that's really interesting is using a very classical art technique of anamorphic graphics, Trump Loy forced perspective, and applying it now onto these screens. This has been a very um, well-known uh, Nike advertising example. If you look very closely, what that is, is that screen on the left side turns a corner, right? And this works very well in these tight urban corridors where you have a very restricted viewpoint. And if you don't quite understand why this is not real 3D, this is a wonderful video a marketing agency made showing their process for making these things. They actually start in a 3D model space where they create these things in uh, three dimensions, but then you have to pick a favored viewpoint in the real world that you want everything forced perspective oriented towards. So that one view gets a gorgeous, realistic 3D view, everywhere else, unfortunately, gets a sort of wildly distorted uh, image. But there are a lot of cases where you do have restricted view corridors, and it works very well. At a smaller scale in architecture now, we can add the, the floors, the walls, the ceilings, any surface can become a digital screen. And when you walk into these environments, you literally lose perception of what's around you. It literally becomes a full body, one-to-one -one virtual reality experience. And if you notice this uh, video clip again, the moment you see you lose the corner in this video, you really lose perception that you're standing in a room. Another great topic, really exciting area to talk about um, for these is layered realities. Um, this is another image from my thesis from way back in 1999. And at that time, I was studying a lot of theatrical lighting techniques. And if you understand lighting, you know that all light is additive, right? And in theater, there's a lot of tricks for controlling what you see, a classical scrim where less, uh, you can fade the lighting from the front to the back and suddenly you can see something hiding behind that scrim in plain sight. Nowadays, we have all sorts of transparent OLEDs and transparent LED screens. But once you start to layer physical and digital and digital and physical and various layers of combinations and you can smartly reveal whether it's the digital or the physical, um, you can then start to think about using your body as an actual control mechanism for revealing what you see. Your body becomes a computer mouse, basically, in physical space. It's probably a little simpler to think of some real examples here. This is an LED screen that is transparent in an architectural scale. And what I mean by that is if you get up really closely to that, you see very fine lines of um, LED screens about a couple millimeters wide, but at the scale of a building or a room or even an urban plaza, it looks transparent. Um, this is a combination of a solid LED floor with a transparent screen on the back. And you can start to see very easily what I mean by layered realities. Um, you could have several layers of the transparent screen behind there to create sort of parallax views. You could add physical props in on the ground, such as coral reef or stone pieces, um, and it all starts to blend together. 
This is a, a delightful example of a dining experience called Les Petit Chef and Friends, where they use a projector over every single table. And uh, I think the only trick here is that the plate has to be really aligned, right? They must have some guidance or dip in the, the table surface so the plate is always perfectly aligned. And then the rest of this is just forced perspective from your viewpoint. And uh, it just creates a moment of delight. And again, what is what is reality and what is digital and how do they play together off each other? And we can start to combine these techniques as entire wall surfaces surrounding you and projection mapping on tables. And again, layers of reality here where you are part of this experience and the digital and the physical is sort of fused throughout the room. This is an example of a bad use of layered realities, right? Where you have this huge LED screen behind the physical merchandise, but that content doesn't interact or relate to the physical pieces. It's just some standard marketing role running behind it. And uh, it just misses the opportunity to play with the actual physical sneakers that are there. This is an example of a delightful, absolutely gorgeous use. This is a digital screen where you have an actual scarf hanging there. And from some hidden you know, air cannon somewhere on the ceiling or behind that, you can create uh, a direct relationship between the virtual and physical worlds. This is um, it, an example of a retail media network, a company called Cooler Screens. And I just really like this graphic where it also talks about, I think from a more of a digital marketing perspective, you're probably more used to this. They were replacing uh, refrigerator doors with these LCD screens. So they needed to replicate the reality of looking at a planogram or of looking at a real rack of merchandise. But then all of the ways that you can add on to that, right? You can add motion graphic effects around the merchandise. You could add videos within the box space of the merchandise. You can add you know, bars of advertising messages or complete takeover messages in front of you. And again, your body position determines that as you move towards the door, it might change from a full door ad into a category piece. <clears throat> um, next area of creative exploration that you can think about is ambient communications. Um, we have two vision systems, and the focused vision system is what most people immediately think of when they think of your vision, right? And that's roughly a two-degree corridor that you look at, and that is intense. It is focused. It uses a lot of brain power. It needs your constant attention. We have a second system, though, that's our peripheral vision system, right? That's very wide, almost 180 degrees. And it's also very lightweight on your brain, and it's incredibly fast. And I, we think that there's sort of an evolutionary um, result of that. You're in the jungle. You need to see if something is hiding in the bush about to eat you, even if you're not paying attention to it, right? Well, we can exploit that in physical places to create some wonderful experiences, right? So we have this incredibly powerful peripheral vision system. We also have this human proclivity for motion, right? Imagine looking at the dappling light on a beautiful lake, right? Or laying in a hammock under the trees and looking at the leaves bristling above you. Uh, it's very soothing. We love biomimetic motion in our vision system. We also have this human tendency for meaning making like the cliche in uh, army movies where, you know, code red battle stations. I guarantee you if all the lights in your space, wherever you are now, suddenly went red and flashing, you would say, what does that mean? I want to know. So we combine these things. We can start to say that there are various vision modes for ambient communications. Uh, color, motion, intensity, variation. These are things we can play with at the scale of an entire physical room that's surrounding you that's outside of your focus. We can tie that then into various data streams. So uh, it could be anything. It could be the weather. It could be the stock market price, but it could also be social media data streams such as accumulation or action rate. And you can tie those to the various ambient media modes. So let me give you some specific examples. The first one is called thumbs up for a cause. Let's say you have a large video wall in a retail location or perhaps a corporate lobby, and you want to show the goal, uh, progress towards a goal, right? So the number of likes equals the color of the wall, how it changes over time. Hot or not, this is an example of a fashion retailer where you might have a physical mannequin displaying merchandise 
and a lighting uh, sculpture or piece around it, the rate of online shopping could drive the rate of the lighting effect in the store. So a store manager might look at the mannequin and the lighting and say, oh, wow, something is really going on online. I should check out what that is. Another one, the final one is sparkling service. Let's say you're in a restaurant, you have a sort of digitally controlled animated sparkling wall. It could be controlled by the average results of your online reviews, weekly reviews for the restaurant. So Monday morning, the restaurant manager comes in, he sees that the wall is really sluggish. He could say, oh wait, what's going on? Checks out his reviews and realizes he had a bad service week and needs to make adjustments. So as you see, how does this actually play? You had a accumulation of social likes changed the color. You had the live action rate of purchases change the sort of variation of the lighting pattern. And you said kind of this sort of uh, aggregation of social proof or the average of social proof changing just patterns, biomimetic patterns. Another exciting topic that we can do is interactivity. Now for, for almost two decades, we've been able to track where people are in physical space. This is an example of uh, Audi did this at a, a trade show. And what you see there though, is you just have a blob of light following people around. And I call this the me and my shadow problem where yes, for two decades, we've been able to track people and have lighting effects correspond to that. But there's been no really good reason to do that other than just the effect of me and my shadow. So let's dive in a little bit on this. When you actually have physical retail or you have a restaurant or you have a healthcare environment and you want to put interactivity or immersive experiences in there, what, what, can, what inter interactivity can you engage with? Well, touch, your fingers, your hands, proximity. How close are you to an object or a wall? occupancy, right? For example, do you have a, a lighting control that turns the lights off automatically when the room is empty? A more precise version of that is tracking, where you do these stereo vision cameras and you can track um, how many people and where they are in a room. And then also identity, you tag in or out. And this is usually the point in the discussion where someone raises their hand and says, well, what about privacy? Privacy, privacy, privacy. And I say, that's really um, a sort of red herring and a distraction. Um, there is a clear progression of anonymity throughout our life, right? If you think in real life, in just terms of a physical environment, let's say you're approaching someone's home, you are on the street, that's a perfectly open space. You move onto the sidewalk, that's slightly more um, less public. You cross the gate to their front yard, that's even less public. You step onto their front porch, less public. You step into their parlor or entry room, less public. You could go all the way through their kitchen, the house, and wind up in sort of the, the bathroom off of their bedroom as the most private space in the house, right? At some point in there, you move from being anonymous to being a checked-in, personalized, known entity, right? And we have to think about that in these various applications, right? So if we have at the left end of the scale, you are untracked. There is no sensor systems. You are living in a mud hut somewhere there and you are a ghost, right? But if you just think about going into any sort of modern restaurant or airport and you go to the water faucet, there is a sensor on there that tracks you and automatically turns on the faucet, right? I don't think anybody is complaining about privacy there, but in a way you are being tracked. The building is monitoring your presence in front of the faucet and it's turning you on. Now, no data is collected and there's no personalization associated with that. But we also have sort of interfaces, right? Let's say fast food ordering. Uh, when you walk up to a menu board and you, you browse, or you look, or let's say a, a map system in an airport or a shopping mall, right? Now, there's plenty of applications though where you have to check in. Like you, it, your anonymity is not an option, right? For example, airports. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get on an airplane full of anonymous people who, you know, nobody has vetted, right? Healthcare, hotels, hospitality. These are all situations where you have to check in, you have to identify yourself, right? So you can start with basic data. And then as you get more personalized, as people opt in more, as their data is collected, you can up the levels of service, right? That's the typical exchange, your personal data for enhanced service until you get up to this level of data and personalization and understanding how you act in the space so you can create these almost genie-like magical experiences that you will have a future where the AI systems and machine learning is simply 
predicting you better than anyone personally could in that space. Um, also, you know, there's so many technologies underlying all this, right? For example, um, any high school kid could download TensorFlow open source, put it on a, you know, a $25 Raspberry Pi computer and do vision tracking nowadays. The, the cost of that is so low, there's almost no barriers to entry. The professional systems like Advertima, you know, they're really sophisticated. They can estimate how old someone is, their sex, they can estimate how long they're lingering, their gaze, all of these things, and still do that anonymously if needed. And then, of course, there's the, the non-anonymous. You are part of a club or group. It's a CRM system. Um, you go into your favorite hotel, and when you walk into the lobby, you don't have to do anything to check in. It just knows you're there. It instantly sends a message to your app. It says, Welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, to the Hilton. We've already checked you in. Uh, please turn right to your lobby, right? So this is a, a slide that I use in lighting, but it applies very much towards immersive digital experiences. What are meaningful interactions with architecture? And by that, I mean the physical places. So if you walk into a retail store and it's infused with digital signage and sensing and touch screens and all that, what do you want to do as a person in that experience uh, that creates meaning to you? Why, why do it other than gimmick? You know, why, why do we do that? Well, we can deliver function, the right light at the right place at the right time. And that could be anything, the right data, the right media. Uh, we can deliver delight, right? Simply enriching human interactions by creating new memories, right? As you get older, your mind compresses memories more and more and time seems to accelerate. Um, if you create more distinct changes, and this is the best thing about digital, is that it can be dynamic over time and always present you something new and fresh. You can keep people feeling invigorated when they visit your hotel or uh, store. And then you can just simply deliver content, right? But really treating architecture as a portal to the virtual world. What are real examples of that, though? What could be a real return on investment? This is an example by Jason Bruges Studio out of London. This is a, a, a hospital environment. These are very sick kids. They're walking down this corridor to get CAT scans or MRIs. And what happened is, is that these kids were very intimidated. Hospitals are very scary environments. So this um, Jason Bruges, the artist, put these kind of very crude, low resolution LED screens hiding behind the wallpaper and shows these little animals that sort of magically appear. And that distracts the kids just enough, probably at their, their most intense moment of anxiety, that they actually got noticeably better scans, right? They didn't have to redo the scans because the kids were crying or fidgety or upset. Very real return on investment. Um, you can start to make this stuff into very predictable patterns. And in fact, this was from my thesis once again. And I said, in the future, we're going to have these interactive surfaces, objects, and zones in architecture, and we can correlate those to our eyes, body, and hands. Um, you think about good UI design. Well, what does that mean in a physical place, right? Um, you also have active objects, surfaces, and zones that can change luminosity, color, the texture, the dynamics, and a variety of other media. So the challenge now is to sort of take this almost periodical table of the elements of interactivity in physical places and figure out what is the ROI, right? Why do we do this in our project? What's the, what's the return that we get? Um, there are new design technologies that I think a lot of professionals in architecture and interiors, retail design are just not even aware of yet. Um, this, for example, is an image of a lighting control system that is purely driven by data input, no preset scenes. And we are going to have this whole new control methodology for our built environments that it doesn't really exist nowadays. The current way is basically derived from the theater world where we have preset scenes. You set all of your lighting and content. You call that a scene. You change your lighting. You change your content. You record that as scene two and then you have some fade between them, right? That's, that's not good enough at all for immersive digital experiences. We need a system where on the left, we collect data, we collect sensing, we have pre-scripted data tables like ca calendars and holidays and sports events. 
And then it goes into a sort of logic processing engine where you have the if then statements, the sort of conditional statements that are tuned over time. And that's where the AI and uh, machine learning will really come into play. <clears throat> you have your pre-crafted media content, and then you have your abstraction engines for creating live biomimetic effects or whatever. And then the output is to, to anything that generates light, right? It, whether it's architectural lighting, whether it's a light bulb, a light bulb is a single monochromatic pixel, if you think about it. And I've often said to the architectural lighting world, every pixel is a light source and every light source is a pixel, right? If you think about it, a 4K screen is really 23 million channels of lighting if you break down each pixel into a red, green, and blue subpixel. Um, <clears throat> this is the future for control. And Unreal Engine, if you're not familiar with it, is, is really becoming the thing that eats the world, for, uh, it, to paraphrase it, in architectural visualization. Um, obviously, it's a game engine at its heart. It's used to make professional PlayStation and Xbox games. But it's just becoming widely and very quickly adopted in Hollywood's virtual production studios. It's being widely adopted in architectural visualization and renderings. And it's a phenomenal tool for creating immersive digital experiences where you need to craft interactivity, you need to deal with media. You can use live rendering to make live responsive content rather than always using prescriptive content. So fusing a lot of this together, we have data, we have omni-channel retail, obviously, we have interactivity. So there's a clear trend for location-based retail media networks where you have a lot of eyeballs and people walking around your physical stores. Um, how do you monetize that? How do you serve up advertising within the stores, right? So this is a very hot topic. You see Walmart, you see Amazon, Walgreens, I mean, every, every major retailer has some story to their investors right now about how they'll be selling ads um, at the point of purchase. Now, to take a step back, you can think of these environments as sort of two primary paths. One is data-driven environmental optimization. And, and this is a lot of that sort of smart building IoT story, if you're familiar with that. And that generally remains anonymous. You're looking at you know efficiency gains, making a space work better, you know, selling more product anonymously, whatever. Now, on the other side of it, you sort of have media-driven branded experiences, which generally could be more personalized or certainly more targeted at certain personas might be a better way. And they come together in this space. Um, and, you know, this is, this is the retail media network, <clears throat> excuse me, that Cooler Screens is showing. And what they're doing is they're, they're basically giving the screens to the retailers with the goal of going off to the brands, selling advertising space, and then splitting the um, advertising revenue with the retailers. So it becomes an incredible uh, programmatic advertising platform with the added complication of serving that up across thousands of locations, across tens of thousands, if not more, screens within those locations to the right person that may or may not be anonymous in front of it. So that's the technical challenge that's really behind these retail media networks. But, you know, the effect can be very powerful. I know from the Cooler Screens team that just putting the digital signage on the doors instead of clear glass doors had significant and meaningful um, single digit uplifts in the um, sales rate without even optimizing it. It was a better experience than just looking through glass. Okay, so again, uh, you know, what makes an immersive digital experience? How will you as a, a digital marketer start to engage this, right? You have to think about the digital displays. It becomes every surface of screen, right? The media content has to become designed uh, with a strong attachment to the place itself. It cannot it no longer be generic that, yeah, it's 16 by nine, it goes on a smartphone. Well, you really have to think about the physical location and how does that media content play with it, right? The data of the space. Are you monitoring the people in the space? To what level? You know, are you driving action, physical action, or are you just driving brand impressions? And then do you want the people in the space to interact with your, um, with your display, with your immersive experience, right? So it becomes optimizing placemaking. 
right? It, it becomes developing the sort of digital character of a place, right? You, you, it's almost like an, a digital avatar, right? If an if a architectural space becomes a portal to the virtual world, um, and this is frankly where a lot of architects really do not like digital media in their buildings, that they lose the placemaking control of that space. It becomes the digital media determines the placemaking of that space. And in the background here, I show one of these immersive Van Gogh experiences where it's really just a black box theater with a lot of white walls and a whole lot of projection. And you can instantly change the character of that space because there's really no architectural presence there. It's all digital media. So I will leave you with this. Um, this is a very real world that we live in that you can have architectural surfaces become digital displays just as easy as you can have them be a sheetrock or gypboard with paint or oak panels or whatever. Um, this technology now has existed for at least a decade. Um, it's becoming pervasive because the cost is plummeting, the quality is increasing, the serviceability is becoming much easier. Um, what are you going to do with it though, right? If you can have these digital surfaces throughout the experience that your guests, customers, patients, employees uh, live through on a day-to-day -day basis, how can you really utilize that to create great immersive uh, brand building experiences? Um, I will uh, leave it at that. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me personally, brad at kernerdesign.com. Uh, I also keep a blog at lucep.com. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm happy to connect. Uh, just reach out to me. And I think at that, I will drop out of full screen mode. Thank you so much, uh, Brad. I think that was a really fascinating presentation. A lot of new things for me. I think that... Um, it's very interesting because I've been to one of those Van Gogh, um, you know, yeah. it, it, it's really nice. Van Gogh. Yes, it's it's really interesting. Now, I think my- Wait, wait, my, but I think you're saying, but, right? It's but, really nice. It's really interesting. But would you go back? I wouldn't necessarily repeat <laughs> the, the experience. And that's the yeah. problem with all of those immersive art experiences is that, again, this is what I'm imploring that, you know, the reason I'm speaking at this digital marketing conference is that these are the challenges that digital marketers face every day. How do you get people to return over and over and over again? This has not been considered in architecture and certainly not through the guise of digital media. Those immersive art experiences are, are great for the first five minutes. Then after that, yeah. you're just kind of like, yeah, it's another screen. Yeah, exactly. Which is why I wanted to ask you as the brand then, you know, when we invest in such activities or new kind of, um, you know, innovations, how do we measure the success of such activities? Yeah, uh, so that's something I experienced with cooler screens, right? So they have actual um, sensors in every door. They're doing these refrigerator doors and uh, grocery stores and convenience stores. Hmm. Now, for privacy, they picked hardware that could not sense someone's face. It does not have enough resolution to pick out features of a space. So physically, at a hardware level, it is there's no anonymity or um, privacy issues. And they did that because in the United States, there's been no federal regulation around privacy and sensing and monitoring in spaces. So basically, it's been a lot of lawsuits state by state, lawyers trying to make money off of it and figuring it out. But what cooler screens can do and what those technologies are, they basically use a, a poor man's LIDAR system, just like autonomous cars. And they can sense where a body is, how far away it is, and mm -hmm. how long it's lingering. And then they can start to use um, statistics, you can call it machine learning, whatever you want, to figure out, well, you know, we had this body in front of this door and we served up this ad. And then... You know, we saw an uplift on the merchandise from that cooler section. Uh, so we know that they're going over there and buying it, right? And they can start to make these attributions between the signage and the physical ac actions and activity in the space. So, you know, the marketing world is driven on attribution, right? Trying to make these 
mythical connections between the Super Bowl ad and I click mm -hmm. buy on the on the page, right? It's the same challenges in the physical space and attribution is just as hard, right? It's hard across the digital spectrum and it's hard across the physical spectrum, um, particularly when you have, like I said, uh, phases of anonymity or phases of privacy where sometimes you can only track people generically and you can't figure out who they are. And other mm -hmm. times you know exactly who they are in their entire history. So I think the digital marketers who are making these investments have to be aware of that gradient, that there will be some cases where they really have unbelievable amount of knowledge on their guests or patients or whatever. And there's some cases where they have very little direct attribution and they'll have to make inferences in their um, ROI victories. <laughs> right, right, right. And I guess, you know, it's it's interesting because you showed a lot of examples from, you know, retailers and the hospitality industry, which I think is very much relevant. But what about, um, you know, some unusual industries or products? Have you had experience with, you know, those kinds of um, industries? And uh, from, if, from an advertising point of view or just from an experiential design point of view? From, from, the, experi from the experiential yeah. and the advertising side, yeah. Um, there, that's why I use Jason Bruges' studio with the um, children's hospital scenario <clears throat> because it helps break people out of signage as advertising, you know, just serve up the next Coca-Cola ad sort of mindset because there was a real tangible need by the hospital, uh, which was a physical problem. People were getting anxiety walking down these scary hospital corridors and they had to fix that somehow. Now, any good architecture or architect or interior designer, they could have put, you know, fun wallpaper, children's characters on there, but you know, it all kind of blends in. They needed that extra little bit of activity or interactivity to get the kids to engage, right? Particularly kids nowadays where everything is a touchscreen interactive. It's If it's not interactive, they, they almost don't even see it anymore. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a long history, and I'm talking two decades of these sort of art installations um, where it started with literally musicians using interactive lighting and crazy stuff like that. Um, there was very little uh, return on investment. Groups like Moment Factory out of Canada are now using mm -hmm. very, very gorgeous experiential design to create entire new business propositions, right? They're doing these um, Lumia forest walks where they, they take a park or a, you know, whatever it is, I don't know, golf course, you think you can imagine it, whatever in the winter time is not being used and they turn it into this whole magical experience with interactive lighting and projection mapping and fog effects and you name that and they've turned these locations into major tourist draws that have increased revenue for the whole surrounding towns and um that's been wildly popular for them right now how do you market on that well obviously attractions have been sponsored by brands for years at Disney World and all over the place. Every theme park and so on has sponsorship to that. How can brands start to create immersive experiences such as something as dramatic as a wintertime walk through the forest and make people want to come to that, want to pay, buy the tickets to go experience that, right? Um, that's the sort of experiences that I think brands can do and the only risk is that if you execute it well or you execute it poorly, right? Because clearly it works. There's lots and lots of examples of these companies like Moment Factory and so on um, that create powerful, powerful immersive experiences that get people off the couch to turn off Netflix, to go out in the dead of winter into a forest. And um, it's, it's a lot of fun. It works well. I think you see mm -hmm. the high end of the market, the Louis Vuittons of the world and Prada, they all do these gorgeous pop-ups. They do a lot of these crazy installations, yeah. right? Um, that all is going to become digitally infused. It already is, um, but it's just going to become more and more driven towards that. Nike has been very good at this. Um, Nike has been a very early leader. Um, what I don't understand, Nike doesn't ever seem to follow through on a lot of those um, really bold, like urban scale. You know, they did a running track where the entire track was uh, – 
surrounded by an LED wall. And when you ran around it, it literally paced you. A, a digital avatar of you on the screen paced you. So if, if you got ahead of it or if you got behind of it, you were following yourself around a running track. That was already, I think, eight or nine years ago they did that. Does that answer your question? Right. <laughs> Yes, yes, you know, absolutely. I think it's it's interesting. Now we we don't have so much time now, um, but you gave us a really fantastic presentation, and I'm sure everyone learned a lot from it. I learned a lot from it. I think it was really interesting. So thank you so much, Brad, for for joining us today, and we'll see you again next time. Oh, you're welcome. And like I said to everyone, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I post a lot of fun stuff there. So great. Thank, <laughs> thank you very you so much. much. This is all we got, dreaming about a revolution in our minds. This is all we got. Lock me out of this life institution. I am angry and I on illusions. Yes, I hate, but it's not a solution. Try my best, buddy, I'm just a human. Oh, we don't need this.